beneath the, uh, this nice green layer of vegetation, there is a soil which in some places can go to a metre or more. Uh, here in West Wales the soils tend to be fairly shallow, maybe 10, 20 centimetres or thereabouts. And it's really vital to understand uh, the important processes that happen here. The dead bodies of all the plants that are growing here um, are decomposed in the soil. And the process of decomposition is vital uh, for the, the carbon cycle of the planet because the carbon dioxide that's fixed by the plants is then released in decomposition. And it's particularly the fungi in the soil that are really important for this job. The other thing that the fungi also do is having decomposed the plant material, they feed back the nutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus and the other elements back to the plants. Um, they link up to the roots of plants in structures called mycorrhizas. And it's a particular group of fungi that form mycorrhizas with the plants that I'm particularly interested in uh, because they're very sensitive to many of the things that we do in modern land management and agriculture, uh, particularly ploughing and fertiliser addition. These, these fungi aren't used to these disturbances and they're essentially destroyed from the habitat uh, when these things happen and it can take them decades, possibly centuries to come back in. In this part of the country, um, this lowland area, much of it has been ploughed. So I've brought you here today to Plas Planejeron. Uh, it's an 18th century manor house built by the famous architect John Nash. We're not really here to look at the house itself, it's the lawn that is particularly interesting to us because the lawn is probably the same age as the house and it's been managed just by being clipped ever since the house was built. And therefore these sort of ancestral, these older fungal populations still exist here and we know that because if we come here in the autumn we see this huge diversity of colours of these wax cap fungi and various other types of fungi like fairy clubs. But today I'm here in the height of summer. The rain here might make you doubt my words on that point. Um, but this is not really mushroom season. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample the soil. The main implant I'm going to use today is a soil corer. I can push this into the soil, maybe only about 10 centimetres this far. I can turn it a little bit and I can extract the soil core. I'm not just going to take one soil core. I'm going to take maybe 30 or so from this particular area. Um, because I want to average out over the whole area and I want to pick up all the fungi. The fungi have their little domains. I can then mix all those cores together and when we come to extracting the DNA uh, later on we can see which species are present and how abundant they are in that particular soil sample. Here's one of the cores I've just taken. It's compressed a little bit from the 10 centimetres. Um, but you can see I've, I've deliberately uh, captured some of the vegetation on top. Um, so the roots of the plants are there. And if the fungi are inside the roots, we'll find them, as well as the fungi in the soil. And you'll notice that it, despite it being rather wet weather past week or so, uh, this part is quite dry. And it's important to appreciate that the structure of the soil, as well as its composition, are, are really important. All these little channels that all the soil animals have made are allowing air in, and they allow water to shed off the surface mm -hmm. and to drain evenly. It's important for the function of the soil that oxygen can get in and that water, when it's dry, can also get in, but not too much of it. Because the fungi, whilst we see them in the autumn with the mushrooms being formed, and we can appreciate them then, they're around all year. In fact, they live probably longer than we do. Just gradually growing, degrading the soil organic matter, feeding it back to the plants. So when you see a mushroom, you have to remember that's just the tip of an iceberg. And the main, the business end of the organism is in the soil. And in every metre squared of soil here, there are sort of a few hundred grams of wax cap mycelium just working away, turning over the organic matter uh, just gradually and feeding those nutrients that are remaining back to the plants. Because of this really poor summer weather we've had, it's fooling all the fungi into fruiting. Um, and here we have uh, the persistent wax cap, this is called, um, Hygrosivia persistence. It's made a mushroom here and also here, just a matter of centimetres away from the edge of the house and the wall is just here. Um, this, this one is quite an interesting one because it is known to fruit quite early. You tend to find it in late August, early September, as opposed to sort of the October, November time that most of these wax caps usually fruit. Um, so this is an example of one that might be missed if we did sampling in the autumn. You'd have to come back now and also in the autumn, whereas when we sample the soil DNA, we capture all these organisms because they're all there in equal abundance all year round. Okay, so I've taken my soil cores. You can see there's maybe 20 or so from this little area of the lawn. Uh, the next step is to take them back to the lab um, and process them so we can get the DNA out of them. 
but now that I've taken these organisms out of their natural environment, uh, things can start to happen in there that might change the fungal community. So I'm going to make sure that I uh, keep the samples cold with these ice cube boxes in this insulated box just for the travel back to Aberystwyth and to our lab where we can process them further. Okay, so we're back in uh, Aberystwyth now at the Ibers Aberystwyth University and I have my samples here. I still feel they're nicely cooled, not frozen, so biological activity has been slowed down there but I want to get them frozen as quickly as possible in this ultra-low freezer. hours, those soil samples will be solidly frozen and then they'll be ready for freeze drying where we remove the water from the sample um, directly to vapour so that there isn't any water present and biological activity is stopped and then we have a dried sample um, without any degradation of DNA or the mycelium of the fungi. Okay so now we've uh, freeze dried our samples and they've been in this desiccator here so this is that they're warming up to room temperature but making sure that they don't become damp again um, and you can see from the bag I can feel this is slightly cold to the touch but it's bone dry and I can crush it it makes it very friable you can see behind me now my colleague Andrew Detheridge is grinding the soil through a fine sieve a little bit like this you can see he's wearing gloves to avoid cross-contaminating different samples and using a pestle. Whip. Um, so the idea here is to grind the stuff into small particles and to mix it all up so that maybe 500 grams of DNA of the soil that we had originally is then ground up and mixed up very efficiently so that when we take a small subsample, less than one gram from that amount, it's representative of what I sampled earlier. So we're now moving from the dirty lab where we ground the soil to the clean lab the molecular biology lab and we're going to extract the DNA from the soil. The first thing to note is that uh, we use a remarkably small amount of DNA. This, this tube is only maybe one-fifth full of soil, about one-fifth of a gram is what we use for this procedure and the kit we use is called Power Soil. It's, it's designed to extract um, all that mucky humic material away from the DNA so that the, all the molecular biology procedures that we use later will work properly and not be inhibited by the mixture of stuff in soil. And the first step that we have with this procedure is to mix the soil with these beads in a buffer and that will bash, the glass beads will bash against the soil particles and break open all the fungal hyphae and they'll release their DNA. This is the first step of the DNA procedure. My colleague James here is just in the middle of one of these procedures um, which maybe takes for 10 samples a couple of hours. Uh, to do, but then we have pure high grade DNA for the later procedures that is representative of what we found this morning in the field. We've purified the DNA and we've also amplified the DNA barcode region of the DNA and this is us looking at some samples to see that by and large they've nearly all worked. Um, some have worked better than others and you can see there's a brighter band of DNA here um, than others and the next step before we sequence all this DNA is to make sure we have the same amount of each one in each sample. So here we are at the, uh, the next generation sequence. So this particular one is an iron torrent personal genome machine. It wasn't designed to help mycologists look at wax cap populations, it was designed to sequence human genomes uh, specifically to be able to pinpoint mutations in cancer for instance. So that was the driver for making this type of technology. The heart of this technology is this wonderful little chip here. On this chip we can get 5 million DNA sequences from this. It has 10 million little holes in it. In each hole a little bead coated with DNA will fall and will be sequenced, mostly to do with the release of acidity. So, two months after our last visit here, it's the depth of autumn, it's late October, and this is peak wax cap season. Uh, so we've come back now uh, to have a look at how the DNA data that we collected uh, fitted in with what actually does produce mushrooms on this lawn. And the most obvious specimen that you see if you just wandered on the lawn is this rather large red wax cap here. 
Um, this is Hygus ivy punicea. If you have this in your grassland, it means your grassland has been undisturbed for a long time, and I'm talking many decades. Uh, we can look at sites and have quite a few species there, but this one only occurs when I think at least 50, maybe 100 years of lack of disturbance is what's required for this organism to sort of grow and fruit. We're still not entirely sure if it was only arriving rather late or if it just took a long time to develop. Uh, but it's a, a clearly a good indicator of an excellent wax cap grassland. And the DNA data suggested that this was a high proportion. There was a, a lot of the DNA of this, maybe it was 10, 20% of all the fungal DNA in this lawn was this species. It's, it's the giant, it's the behemoth of the wax cap world. So this is the snowy wax cap, now called Cuphophilus virginius. Um, and this is quite a common species. Um, you could find this in, in many lawns, garden lawns that are maybe have been sympathetically managed for 10 or 20 years. It's one of the earlier wax caps to uh, sort of colonize a lawn and fruit. Um, and here on Tladecheren lawn, its presence is some profusion. And it's, it's kind of, uh, as I look here, this is, I can see the arc of a fairy ring. Okay, so now we find a, a fairy club. This is called Clavelinopsis corniculata. I think it's a stag's head fairy club. Uh, this is surprisingly common. Um, if you look on the lawn, and once you've got your eye in on these things, uh, you'll notice quite a lot of them. In fact, there's several fruit bodies. I'm sat in the middle of a, a fairy ring here. It's only about a metre in diameter. Um, so that's on top of the mycelium of this particular individual. We find it makes up, um, I think it's 10% or so of all the mycelium in the lawn. And this and the other fairy clubs, along with the wax caps, um, they form the great majority of all the fungal DNA in, in this lawn and in other older grasslands. Okay, so here we have the, what we know as the pink wax cap or the ballerina. This is one of the iconic wax cap species. Um, but I'm sure you can notice that it's not particularly pink because here, and as far as I know, only here, um, we have the albino variety of this fungus. Its uh, proper name is Porpolomopsis calyptiformis, which is quite a mouthful. Um, we barcoded this one because we knew of this one from a few years ago. We've, we've DNA barcoded it and we can't tell it apart from the normal pink wax cap for the particular bit of DNA that we look at. Um, we also detect this in the soil as well. Um, if, we'd, if we had done a little localised sampling just around this area, we would find it here, but probably not in other parts of the lawn. You can see it's a lovely pointed shape here and uh, the cap is initially sort of, it's, it's quite sort of uh, steep sided and then as the, the mushroom matures the, the edge of the gills and the cap open up just like the costume of a, of a ballerina. So now I'm just going to add this to my set of samples. If I, if I go to any site I make a collection of fruit bodies that I dry carefully when I get back to the lab and if we want to DNA barcode the sample in the future this is like a reference specimen. The DNA from this is what we use to match up with this mass of DNA sequences that the iron torrent chip gives us. Okay, so now we have um, the spreadsheet here, and in rows um, on the first couple of columns, you can see the names of all the fungi. Um, and I've helpfully highlighted these in pink to show the wax caps and the fairy clubs, uh, just to illustrate the fact that these groups of fungi are forming uh, the great majority of the DNA that's present in the soil. Um, and amongst them, I see what well, most of the species we've mentioned, and nearly all the ones that we've actually found fruit bodies of, um, have been detected in the DNA. The data we've got for here and for other similar grassland sites is, is fascinating to me. Um, I, I always remember this phrase from Leonardo da Vinci from 500 years ago, um, that we know more about the celestial bodies than we do about the soil beneath our feet. And that statement has been true for five centuries, and it's only just now that we're beginning to understand, for the fungi at least, um, how complex and fascinating their life cycles and biology is. So my focus when we've done the work at uh, Llanajero has been on the fungi of conservation importance, the wax caps and the fairy clubs that are rare because their habitats are really rare. Um, but my general interests are in soil ecology and that includes all soils, um, possibly, you know, possibly including agricultural soils where how the soil works is really important for agricultural production. Um, and I find it's useful to mention about the wax caps because that attracts people's attention. Soil isn't the most interesting of subjects. Um, 
but I, I do feel that you can get people to realise that soil is important by telling them about the wax caps. These are the, kind of the film stars, if you like, of the fungal world. And the reason why we have uh, these lovely grasslands here and in other places in Wales is because of the National Trust and the fact that they manage these grasslands appropriately. My name's Gwen Posh and I'm a ranger with the National Trust. Um, we look after these grasslands and we mow them regularly every six weeks and then when it comes to wax cap season in October we stop mowing and we just let the wax caps do their thing and they start to come through and appear as these little jewels in the soil. It's absolutely beautiful. We tend to stop people from walking on these areas and that prevents trampling of the mycelia under the soil. Um, we also tend to make sure that we don't put things like marquees on the, on the grasslands here as well. So it's pretty amazing that they're here. It's a very specific um, sort of regime that we have to use to make sure that they stay here. We also don't put any pesticides or herbicides on the soil.